hello to all of you 30,000 subscribers across four platforms. Do we have a story for you? But before we begin, if you haven't subscribed to our website already, please do so. So if we are deplatformed from social media, you can continue to engage with our work. If you're not already there, head to artistsfamily.is and click on the subscribe tab. Today we are going to explore community transmission of SARS-CoV-2. We want to investigate the popular idea that by taking two COVID vaccines or more, you are helping to stem infection rates, helping to protect vulnerable people and helping to lay COVID to rest. As this idea seems to be at the very heart of what's dividing communities and families right now, we want to know whether there is any scientific evidence for it. A Burnett Institute modelling report commissioned by the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services published on the 18th of September stated, the vaccine's prevention of infection is approximated as leaky, meaning that each person vaccinated has reduced but non-zero risk of becoming infected based on the vaccine efficacy. To many people, including some doctors, COVID vaccines are just vaccines. These folk do not distinguish between transmission-stopping vaccines like the ones we had when we were kids and leaky vaccines that do not stop transmission. To understand the problem of leaky or imperfect vaccines, this peer-reviewed research from 2015, prior to the politicisation and then denial of this issue, explains what problems can occur when employing leaky vaccines in both humans and animals. When vaccines prevent transmission, as is the case for nearly all vaccines used in humans, the natural evolution towards increased virulence is blocked. But when vaccines leak, allowing at least some pathogen transmission, they could create the ecological conditions that would allow hot strains to emerge and persist. This theory proved highly controversial when it was first proposed over a decade ago, but here we report experiments with Marix disease virus in poultry that show that modern commercial leaky vaccines can have precisely this effect. They allow the onward transmission of strains otherwise too lethal to persist. Thus, the use of leaky vaccines can facilitate the evolution of pathogen strains that put unvaccinated hosts at greater risk of severe disease. The future challenge is to identify whether there are other types of vaccines used in animals and humans that might also generate these evolutionary risks. The study is indicating that leaky COVID vaccines, more so than the virus itself, could be putting unvaccinated people at higher risk of severe disease. Well, that's one way of killing off all the non-compliers in society. But more seriously, considering who is actually dying from SARS-CoV-2, remembering that the median age for COVID mortality in Australia is 84 years, and nearly 75% of people who die with COVID have chronic comorbidities, and COVID-19 death rates are 10 times higher in countries where more than half of the adult population is classified as overweight, then the most vulnerable in society are potentially made even more vulnerable by leaky vaccines. So if that's the case, how does the sentiment, I'm rolling up my sleeves for vulnerable people really work? Because if leaky vaccines contribute to the most vulnerable being infected and allow for the onward transmission of strains, which in turn reduces the efficacy of the vaccines, then what is actually being achieved? In 2015, Andrew Reid, a biology professor from Pennsylvania State University, was quoted in an article in Science saying, We are entering the era of leaky vaccines in humans. We need to have a responsible discussion about this. But we never did have that discussion. Back in September of this year, a week before the Burnett Institute report was published, we published a video titled is Australia's COVID roadmap already outmoded? In the video, we quote an evolutionary biologist giving context for why the modelling is flawed due to using leaky vaccines, drawing on the work of vaccinologist Gert van den Bosch. Gert van der Bosch, who is the senior program manager of the Ebola vaccine implementation team, has been critical of health measures used throughout this pandemic. He says, mass infection prevention and mass vaccination with leaky COVID-19 vaccines in the midst of the pandemic can only breed highly infectious variants. His views have been ignored, ridiculed and censored, but his theory is gaining plenty of evidence as the data comes in. And as the new Omicron variant is three times more infectious, 
than the highly infectious Delta variant, we are seeing this reality unfold. While this new variant is said to have come from Africa, where there are low levels of vaccination, Omicron was already spreading in the highly vaccinated Netherlands before it had a name. Back in February, this correspondence in The Lancet, immune evasion means we need a new COVID-19 social contract, drew attention to the real world problem of immune escape in a pandemic. The authors wrote, if substantial immune evasion occurs, current vaccines are likely to still offer some benefit to individuals. At the population level, however, they could induce viral selection and escape, making the prospect of achieving herd immunity increasingly remote. If leaky vaccines are potentially enhancing transmissibility and making people more vulnerable, why are governments mandating them? This opinion piece in the conversation by two Australian academics funded by the Australian and New Zealand governments does not mention the fact that the vaccines are leaky and thus pose a potential advantage for the virus. Instead, they stick with the ideological narrative that unvaccinated people are the problem, not leaky vaccines. The authors write that recent reports from the Victorian Department of Health find that unvaccinated people are 10 times more likely to contract COVID than vaccinated people. If you click on the link they provide to back up their claims, it doesn't take you to a peer-reviewed study, but to a Sky News article, which includes no links to any scientific papers whatsoever. The government-sponsored authors continue Despite vaccination providing excellent protection against severe disease, a small proportion of vaccinated people still require ICU care. Therefore, some vaccinated people may have a strong preference to mix primarily with other vaccinated people. We have to remember that Australia and New Zealand are four to six months behind the global north on the data and breakthrough infections are only just beginning to emerge. This recent correspondence in The Lancet provides context for just how smug and societally dangerous the conversation hit piece is. In Germany, the rate of symptomatic COVID-19 cases among the fully vaccinated is reported weekly since the 21st of July and was 16.9% at that time among patients of 60 years and older. This proportion is increasing week by week and was 58.9% on the 27th of October 2021. While vaccine producers are not yet accepting that their leaky vaccines may well be creating the evolutionary pressures to produce more infectious variants, they are indeed planning for a future of them. This article in Nature follows that journey, giving context for just how lucrative the imperfect or leaky vaccine market is for these companies. The author writes, over the past few months, Pfizer, Moderna and AstraZeneca have been running dress rehearsals by practicing on known SARS-CoV-2 variants. When Omicron landed a few weeks back, the variant made $10 billion in a week for top Moderna and Pfizer shareholders. In a technocultish and capitalist society, governments praise instead of investigate the imperatives of industry. The future we're all facing is endless seasonal vaccines, and whether we need them or not, or whether they cause more harm than good, the data will no doubt be obscured by the rhetoric so as not to upset the conveyor belts of industry. There is a paternalism advancing here that attacks first people's ways of knowing, ways of knowing that we need to reclaim if we are to seriously address the coming crises of ecological and climate ruination and ever widening social division. We cannot underestimate the intervention that behavioural psychologists have made over the past two years. Employed by governments, specialised psychologists use behavioural insights for the purposes of crafting the right message. Critiques of behavioural insights can be boiled down to two main charges, writes Michael Hallsworth, a leading figure in developing the field of applying behavioural science to government. One, that the approach is manipulative, and two, that it is paternalistic. To his credit, Hallsworth confirms these are legitimate criticisms and our goal is not to rebut or minimise them. Hallsworth is the managing director of the North America Behavioural Insights team who have offices all across the world. The Victorian government also works with this same crew. In a transparent society, we would call the Behavioural Insights unit of a government the propaganda or PR department. 
But in an increasingly mediated and corporatized world, we remove the words propaganda and public relations and replace them with science. Behavioral science has blossomed throughout the pandemic. When you hear the same well-intentioned catchphrases over and over like, I'm rolling up my sleeves for vulnerable people, rest assured this sentiment has come down the line from behavioral insight psychologists. While it is a noble and community-minded idea, we are discovering it is not actually rooted in scientific evidence. It is in fact an open question whether the vaccines themselves are actually impacting vulnerable people in negative ways, but it is absolutely clear the vaccine mandates are producing a new class of vulnerable people. This correspondence, COVID-19 stigmatizing the unvaccinated is not justified, published in The Lancet, argues that people who receive COVID-19 vaccinations are able to both contract and spread the disease. The author states, there is increasing evidence that the vaccinated individuals continue to have a relevant role in transmission. The author continues, saying, people who are vaccinated have a lower risk of severe disease, but are still a relevant part of the pandemic. It is therefore wrong and dangerous to speak of a pandemic of the unvaccinated. The author, Dr. Gunter Kampf, goes on to quote studies that demonstrate this assertion, akin to this longitudinal study also published in The Lancet. These authors write in conclusion that although vaccines remain highly effective at preventing severe disease and deaths from COVID-19, our findings suggest that vaccination is not sufficient to prevent transmission of the Delta variant in household settings with prolonged exposure. Given the household is the primary setting for infection, and given that transmission is not stopped by vaccinating the populace, why then the continuation of socially harming health measures such as mandatory vaccination? Another study from the NIH in the US investigated the relationship between the percentage of population fully vaccinated and new COVID-19 cases across 68 countries and across nearly 3,000 counties in the US. The authors found of the top five counties that have the highest percentage of population fully vaccinated, 99.9 to 84.3%, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention identifies four of them as high transmission counties. The authors concluded, that the sole reliance on vaccination as a primary strategy to mitigate COVID-19 and its adverse consequences needs to be re-examined, especially considering the Delta variant and the likelihood of future variants. Those who advocate for vaccinations should therefore focus on research that demonstrates double vaccinated persons, for a short time, are less likely to experience severe symptoms themselves while being honest and refer to the evidence that the vaccines do not stop transmission and possibly enhance the evolutionary pressure to create more variants. In all its forms, the virus will have its way with us regardless, be we vaccinated or vaccine free, and so there is more grief to come. Our own response to this scenario is less technical and more human. While anthropocentric technologies are a relatively useless fight against a shape-shifting virus, people are hurting because of the politics of the pandemic. Families and communities are splintering and a new kind of vulnerable group is emerging. Those who have lost their jobs, been locked out of using local government services and who have been scapegoated by a monocultural and fanatical vaccinate everyone at all costs ideology amplified by court journalism and press release reportage. That government officials are not definitively stating that the vaccines are leaky that they are not producing meaningful immunity or lowering transmission, and they are quite possibly extending the pandemic is dishonest and is feeding division. We each have the choice to not buy into the segregation politics, the behavioral insight manipulations, and the government sponsored hit pieces parading as evidence. Well, that's the update for the week. If you'd like to support our work, please head to our website and click on the support tab. Sending much love, from Jarrah People's Country.